Hello there. How are you? I hope you are very well. My name is Gilda Jackson, and I am a fireside reader. I read old books in front of the fire to people who might uh, need a little companionship and friendship and some wonderful old entertainment performed slightly for you, read to you in an old-fashioned way. That's the goal, that, uh, that there are people out there who might find a little comfort in listening to these books. And I hope that if you are one of those people and uh, you want a little bit of this entertainment, that you do find it and that you share it with other people who you think might also like it. We have read many books. All of them can be found at the YouTube channel Fireside Reading. Or we read every day at 5 o'clock Pacific time on Instagram at Fireside Reading. And we are quite a lot over halfway through Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. We're going to read today chapters 50 and 51. Lydia, poor Lydia, has run off with Mr. Wickham, who is a scoundrel. And it's just been discovered, but luckily Uncle Gardner went and sorted things out. So now it seems like Lydia and Wickham are going to be married. We're all back at the house, Longbourn. And now we're going to find out what happens next. So welcome to a fireside reading of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 50. Mr. Bennet had very often wished before this period of his life that instead of spending his whole income, he had laid by an annual sum for the better provision of his children and of his wife, if she survived him. He now wished it more than ever. Had he done his duty in that respect, Lydia need not have been indebted to her uncle for whatever of honour or credit could now be purchased for her. The satisfaction of prevailing on one of the most worthless young men in Great Britain to be her husband might then have rested in its proper place. He was seriously concerned that a cause of so little advantage to anyone should be forwarded at the sole expense of his brother-in-law, and he was determined, if possible, to find out the extent of his assistance and to discharge the obligation as soon as he could. When first Mr. Bennet had married, economy was held to be perfectly useless, for, of course, they were to have a son. The son was to join in cutting off the entail as soon as he should be of age, and the widow and younger children would by that means be provided for. Five daughters successively entered the world, but yet the son was to come, and Mrs. Bennet, for many years after Lydia's birth, had been certain that he would. This event had at last been despaired of, but it was then too late to be saving. Mrs. Bennet had no turn for economy, and her husband's love of independence had also prevented their exceeding their income. £5,000 was settled by marriage articles on Mrs. Bennet and the children, and in what proportions it should be divided amongst the latter depended on the will of the parents. This was one point with regard to Lydia, at least, which was now to be settled, and Mr. Bennet could have no hesitation in acceding to the proposal before him. In terms of grateful acknowledgement for the kindness of his brother, though expressed most concisely, he then delivered on paper his perfect approbation of all that was done and his willingness to fulfil the engagements that had been made for him. He had never before supposed that could Wickham be prevailed on to marry his daughter, it would be done with so little inconvenience to himself as by the present arrangement. He would scarcely be ten pounds a year the loser by the hundred that was to be paid them, 
for what with her board and pocket allowance and the continual presence in money which passed to her through her mother's hands, Lydia's expenses had very little within that sum. That it would be done with such trifling exertion on his side, too, was another very welcome surprise, for his wish at present was to have as little trouble in the business as possible. When the first transports of rage which had produced his activity in seeking her were over, he naturally returned to all his former indolence. His letter was soon dispatched, for though dilatory in undertaking business, he was quick in its execution. He begged to know further particulars of what he was indebted to his brother, but was too angry with Lydia to send any message to her. The good news spread quickly through the house and with proportionate speed through the neighbourhood. It was born in the latter with decent philosophy. To be sure, it would have been more for the advantage of conversation had Miss Lydia Bennet come upon the town or, as the happiest alternative, been secluded from the world in some distant farmhouse. But <coughs> there was much to be talked of in marrying her and the good-natured wishes for her well-doing, which had proceeded before from all the spiteful old ladies in Meryton, lost but a little of their spirit in this change of circumstances, because with such a husband her misery was considered certain. It was a fortnight since Mrs. Bennet had been downstairs, but on this happy day she again took her seat at the head of her table, and in spirits oppressively high. No sentiment of shame gave a damp to her triumph, the marriage of a daughter which had been the first object of her wishes since Jane was sixteen was now on the point of accomplishment, and her thoughts and her words ran wholly on those attendants of elegant nuptials, fine muslins, new carriages, and servants. She was busily searching through the neighbourhood for a proper situation for her daughter, and without knowing or considering what their income might be, rejected many as deficient in size and importance. Hay Park might do, she said, if the Goulding's could quit it, or the great house at Stoke, if the drawing room were larger. But Ashworth is too far off. I could not bear to have her ten miles from me, and as for Pulvis Lodge, the attics are dreadful. Her husband allowed her to talk on without interruption while the servants remained, but when they had withdrawn, he said to her, Mrs. Bennet, before you take any or all of these houses for your son and daughter, let us come to a right understanding. Into one house in this neighbourhood they shall never have admittance. I will not encourage the impudence of either by receiving them at Longbourn. A long dispute followed this declaration, but Mr. Bennet was firm. It soon led to another, and Mrs. Bennet found with amazement and horror that her husband would not advance a guinea to buy clothes for his daughter. He protested that she should receive from him no mark of affection whatever on this occasion. Mrs. Bennet could hardly comprehend it that his anger could be carried to such a point of inconceivable resentment as to refuse his daughter a privilege without which her marriage would scarcely seem valid, exceeded all she could believe possible. She was more alive to the disgrace which her want of new clothes must reflect on her daughter's nuptials than to any sense of shame at the eloping and living with Wickham a fortnight before they took place. Elizabeth was now most heartily sorry that she had, from the distress of the moment, been led to make Mr. Darcy acquainted with their fears for her sister. For since her marriage would so shortly give the proper termination to the elopement, they might hope to conceal its unfavourable beginning from all those who were not immediately on the spot. 
She had no fear of its spreading farther through his means. There were few people on whose secrecy she would have more confidently depended, but at the same time there was no one whose knowledge of a sister's frailty would have mortified her so much. Not, however, from any fear of disadvantage from it individually to herself, for at any rate there seemed a gulf impassable between them. Had Lydia's marriage been concluded on the most honourable terms, it was not to be supposed that Mr Darcy would connect himself with a family where, to every other objection, would now be added an alliance and relationship of the nearest kind with the man whom he so justly scorned. From such a connection, she could not wonder that he would shrink the wish of procuring her regard, which she had assured herself of his feeling in Derbyshire, could not in rational expectation survive such a blow as this. She was humbled, she was grieved, she repented, though she hardly knew of what. She became jealous of his esteem when she could no longer hope to be benefited by it. She wanted to hear of him when there seemed the least chance of gaining intelligence. She was convinced that she could have been happy with him when it was no longer likely they should meet. What a triumph for him, as she often thought, could he know that the proposals which she had proudly spurned only four months ago would now have been most gladly and gratefully received. He was as generous, she doubted not, as the most generous of his sex, but while he was mortal, there must be a triumph. She began now to comprehend that he was exactly the man who, in disposition and talents, would most suit her. His understanding and temper, though unlike her own, would have answered all her wishes. It was an union that must have been to the advantage of both. By her ease and liveliness, his mind might have been softened, his manners improved, and from his judgment, information and knowledge of the world, she must have received benefit of greater importance. But... No such happy marriage could now teach the admiring multitude what connubial felicity really was. An union of a different tendency and precluding the possibility of the other was soon to be formed in their family. How Wickham and Lydia were to be supported in tolerable independence she could not imagine but how little of permanent happiness could belong to a couple who were only brought together because their passions were stronger than their virtue, she could easily conjecture. Mr Gardiner soon wrote again to his brother. To Mr Bennett's acknowledgments, he briefly replied with assurance of his eagerness to promote the welfare of any of his family and concluded with entreaties that the subject might never be mentioned to him again. The principal purport of his letter was to inform them that Mr Wickham had resolved on quitting the militia. It was greatly my wish that he should do so, he added, as soon as his marriage was fixed on, and I think you will agree with me in considering the removal from that corps as highly advisable, both on his account and my niece's. It is Mr Wickham's intention to go into the regulars, and among his former friends, there are still some who are able and willing to assist him in the army. He has the promise of an ensigncy in General Blank's regiment, now quartered in the north. It is an advantage to have it so far from this part of the kingdom. He promises fairly, and I hope among different people, where they may each have a character to preserve, they will both be more prudent. I have written to Colonel Forster to inform him of our present arrangements and to request that he will satisfy the various creditors of Mr Wickham in and near Brighton with assurances of speedy payment for which I have pledged myself. 
And will you give yourself the trouble of carrying similar assurances to his creditors in Meryton, of whom I shall subjoin a list according to his information? He has given in all his debts. I hope at least he has not deceived us. Haggerston has our directions, and all will be completed in a week. They will then join his regiment, unless they are first invited to Longbourn. And I understand from Mrs. Gardiner that my niece is very desirous of seeing you all before she leaves the South. She is well and begs to be dutifully remembered to you and her mother. Yours, etc., E. Gardiner. Mr. Bennet and his daughters saw all the advantages of Wickham's removal from the Shire as clearly as Mr. Gardiner could do. But Mrs. Bennet was not so well pleased with it. Lydia's being settled in the north, just when she had expected most pleasure and pride in her company, for she had by no means given up her plan of their residing in Hertfordshire, was a severe disappointment. And besides, it was such a pity that Lydia should be taken from a regiment where she was acquainted with everybody and had so many favourites. She is so fond of Mrs. Forster, said she. It would be quite shocking to send her away. And there are several of the young men, too, that she likes very much. The officers may not be so pleasant in General Blank's regiment. His daughter's request for such, it might be considered, of being admitted into her family again before she set off for the North, received at first an absolute negative. But Jane and Elizabeth, who agreed in wishing for the sake of their sister's feelings and consequence that she should be noticed on her marriage by her parents, urged him so earnestly, yet so rationally and so mildly to receive her and her husband at Longbourn as soon as they were married, that he was prevailed on to think as they thought and act as they wished. And their mother had the satisfaction of knowing that she would be able to show her married daughter in the neighbourhood before she was banished to the north. When Mr. Bennet wrote again to his brother, therefore, he sent his permission for them to come, and it was settled that as soon as the ceremony was over, they should proceed to Longbourn. Elizabeth was surprised, however, that Wickham should consent to such a scheme, and had she consulted only her own inclination, any meeting with him would have been the last object of her wishes. Chapter 51 Their sister's wedding, their sister's wedding day arrived. And Jane and Elizabeth felt for her probably more than she felt for herself. The carriage was sent to meet them at blank, and they were to return in it by dinner time. Their arrival was dreaded by the elder Miss Bennets, and Jane more especially, who gave Lydia the feelings which would have attended herself had she been the culprit, and was wretched in the thought of what her sister must endure. They came... The family were assembled in the breakfast room to receive them. Smiles decked the face of Mrs. Bennet as the carriage drove up to the door. Her husband looked impenetrably grave, her daughters alarmed, anxious, uneasy. Lydia's voice was heard in the vestibule. The door was thrown open and she ran into the room. Her mother stepped forwards, embraced her and welcomed her with rapture gave her hand with an affectionate smile to Wickham, who followed his lady, and wished them both joy with an alacrity which showed no doubt of their happiness. Their reception from Mr. Bennet, to whom they then turned, was not quite so cordial. His countenance rather gained in austerity, and he scarcely opened his lips. The easy assurance of the young couple, indeed, was enough to provoke him. Elizabeth was disgusted, and even Miss Bennet was shocked. Lydia was Lydia still, untamed, unabashed, wild, noisy, and fearless. She turned from sister to sister, demanding their congratulations, and when at length they all sat down, looked eagerly round the room, 
took notice of some little alteration in it and observed with a laugh that it was a great while since she had been there. Wickham was not at all more distressed than herself, but his manners were always so pleasing that had his character and his marriage been exactly what they ought, his smiles and his easy address while he claimed their relationship would have delighted them all. Elizabeth had not before believed him quite equal to such assurance, but she sat down resolving within herself to draw no limits in future to the impudence of an impudent man. She blushed and Jane blushed, but the cheeks of the two who caused their confusion suffered no variation of colour. There was no want of discourse. The bride and her mother could neither of them talk fast enough, and Wickham, who happened to sit near Elizabeth, began inquiring after his acquaintance in that neighbourhood with a good-humoured ease which she felt very unable to equal in her replies. They seemed, each of them, to have the happiest memories in the world. Nothing of the past was recollected with pain, and Lydia led voluntarily to subjects which her sisters would not have alluded to for the world. Only think of its being three months, she cried, since I went away. It seems but a fortnight, I declare, and yet there have been things enough happened in the time. Good gracious, when I went away, I am sure I had no more idea of being married till I came back again, though I thought it would be very good fun if I was. Her father lifted up his eyes. Jane was distressed. Elizabeth looked expressively at Lydia, but she, who never heard nor saw anything of which she chose to be insensible, gaily continued, Oh, Mamma, do the people hereabouts know I am married today? I was afraid they might not, and we overtook William Goulding in his curricle. So I was determined he should know it, and so I let down the side glass next to him and took off my glove and let my hand just rest upon the window frame so that he might see the ring. And then I bowed and smiled like anything. Elizabeth could bear it no longer. She got up and ran out of the room and returned no more till she heard them passing through the hall to the dining parlour. She then joined them soon enough to see Lydia, with anxious parade, walk up to her mother's right hand and hear her say to her eldest sister, Ah, Jane, I take your place now and you must go lower because I am a married woman. It was not to be supposed that time would give Lydia that embarrassment from which she had been so wholly free at first. Her ease and good spirits increased. She longed to see Mrs. Phillips, the Lucases, and all their other neighbours, and to hear herself called Mrs. Wickham by each of them. And in the meantime, she went after dinner to show her ring and boast of being married to Mrs. Hill and the two housemaids. Well, Mamma, said she, when they were all returned to the breakfast room, and what do you think of my husband? Is he not a charming man? I am sure my sisters must all envy me. I only hope they may have half my good luck. They must all go to Brighton. That is the place to get husbands. What a pity it is, Mamma, we did not all go. Very true, and if I had my will, we should. But, my dear Lydia, I don't at all like your going such a way off. Must it be so? Oh, Lord, yes, there is nothing in that. I shall like it of all things. You and Papa and my sisters must come down and see us. We shall be at Newcastle all the winter, and I dare say there will be some balls, and I will take care to get good partners for them all. I should like it beyond Anything, said her mother. And when you go away, you may leave one or two of my sisters behind you, and I dare say I shall get husbands for them before the winter is over. 
I thank you for my share of the favour, said Elizabeth, but I do not particularly like your way of getting husbands. Their visitors were not to remain above ten days with them. Mr Wickham had received his commission before he left London, and he was to join his regiment at the end of a fortnight. No one but Mrs Bennet regretted that their stay would be so short, and she made the most of the time by visiting about with her daughter and having very frequent parties at home. These parties were acceptable to all. To avoid a family circle was even more desirable to such as did think than such as did not. Wickham's affection for Lydia was just what Elizabeth had expected to find it, not equal to Lydia's for him. She had scarcely needed her present observation to be satisfied from the reason of things that their elopement had been brought on by the strength of her love rather than by his, and she would have wondered why, without violently caring for her, he chose to elope with her at all, had she not felt certain that his flight was rendered necessary by distress of circumstances, and if that were the case, he was not the young man to resist an opportunity of having a companion. Lydia was exceedingly fond of him. He was her dear Wickham on every occasion. No one was to be put in competition with him. He did everything best in the world, and she was sure he would kill more birds on the 1st of September than anybody else in the country. One morning, soon after their arrival, as she was sitting with her two elder sisters, she said to Elizabeth, Lizzie, I never gave you an account of my wedding, I believe. You were not by when I told Mamma and the others all about it. Are not you curious to hear how it was managed? Not really, replied Elizabeth. I think there cannot be too little said on the subject. La! You are so strange, but I must tell you how it went off. We were married, you know, at St Clement's because Wickham's lodgings was in the parish and it was settled that we should all be there by 11 o'clock. My uncle and aunt and I were to go together and the others were to meet us at the church. Well, Monday morning came and I was in such a fuss, I was so afraid, you know, that something would happen to put it off. And then I should have gone quite distracted. And there was my aunt all the time I was dressing, preaching and talking away just as if she was reading a sermon. However, I did not hear above one word in ten, for I was thinking, you may suppose, of my dear Wickham. I longed to know whether he would be married in his blue coat. Well, and so we breakfasted at ten as usual. I thought it would never be over, for, by the by, you are to understand that my uncle and aunt were horrid unpleasant all the time I was with them. If you'll believe me, I did not once put my foot out of doors, though I was there a fortnight. <laughs> not one party or scheme or anything. To be sure, London was rather thin, but however, the little theatre was open. Well, and so just as the carriage came to my door, my uncle was called away upon business to that horrid man, Mr. Stone. And then, you know, when once they were together, there is no end of it. Well, I was so frightened I did not know what to do, for my uncle was to give me away, and if we were beyond the hour... We could not be married all day, but luckily he came back again in ten minutes' time, and then we all set out. However, I recollected afterwards that if he had been prevented going, the wedding need not be put off, for Mr. Darcy might have done as well. Mr. Darcy? repeated Elizabeth in utter amazement. Oh, yes. He was to come there with Wickham, you know. But, hey, gracious me, I quite forgot I ought not to have said a word about it. <laughs> I promised them so faithfully. What will Wickham say it was to be such a secret? If it was to be a secret, said Jane, say not another word on the subject. You may depend upon my seeking no further. Oh, certainly, said Elizabeth, though burning with curiosity. We will ask you no questions. Thank you, said Lydia, for if you did, I should certainly tell you all. 
and then Wickham would be angry. On such encouragement to ask, Elizabeth was forced to put it out of her power by running away. But to live in ignorance on such a point was impossible, or at least it was impossible not to try for information. Mr. Darcy had been at her sister's wedding. It was exactly a scene and exactly among people where he had apparently least to do and least temptation to go. Conjectures as to the meaning of it, rapid and wild, hurried into her brain, but she was satisfied with none. Those that best pleased her, as placing his conduct in the noblest light, seemed most improbable. She could not bear such suspense, and hastily, seizing a sheet of paper, wrote a short letter to her aunt to request an explanation of what Lydia had dropped, if it were compatible with the secrecy which had been intended. You may readily comprehend, she added, what my curiosity must be to know how a person unconnected with any of us, and, comparatively speaking, a stranger to our family, should have been amongst you at such a time. Pray write instantly and let me understand it, unless it is, for very cogent reasons, to remain in the secrecy which Lydia seems to think necessary, and then I must endeavour to be satisfied with ignorance. Not that I shall, though, she added to herself as she finished the letter, and my dear aunt, if you do not tell me in an honourable manner, I shall certainly be reduced to tricks and stratagems to find out. Jane's delicate sense of honour would not allow her to speak to Elizabeth privately of what Lydia had let fall. Elizabeth was glad of it, till it appeared whether her inquiries would receive any satisfaction. She had rather be without a confidant. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at the same time and place or check out the Fireside Reading YouTube channel. And if you would like to subscribe and comment and like, that would be wonderful. I look forward to seeing you soon. Till then, please be very well. Good night. <laughs>